Hi, I'm Jay, and I'm biased. <laughs> Video game reviews! I used to write them. Now, I grandstand here and talk about them. Last year, I got my ball rolling down the endless hill of YouTube by making my first video essay where I talked about having stopped writing about video games earlier that year. It was long, drawn out, and edited about as effectively as any TV show where they bleep out swears but you can still tell 100% what the swear is. And so now I come before you a year later with something even longer, but hopefully less drawn out because now I speak unreasonably quickly. Video game critique is kind of a minefield to get into, and one of the things that definitely gives those minds a good poke is kind of a misunderstanding between game reviewers and readers. Game reviews, you know, critique as a whole, is a really complicated thing, and it's a thing which I think is often damaged by the weight of the numbered review score. I've been thinking about what makes game reviews tick since long before I started doing this, and so I perked up when this tweet from In Exile Entertainment head Brian Fargo made some rounds earlier this year. Fargo tweeted genuine wonderment at the possibility that a video game could be scored differently at different websites. When Ben Kuchera of Polygon chimed in to explain that this is in fact how critique works, Fargo replied that he'd never thought about game reviews that way, as a completely subjective process. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. For me, as was probably the case for Kuchera, looking at Fargo's initial tweet is a bit innocently baffling. My first reaction to it was very akin to Kuchera's, except I didn't tweet it because we'd really just have this one life to live after all. To my mind, having read a lot of game reviews and written somewhere over a hundred myself, it makes sense to me that this happens. Heck, there was at least one game I reviewed for a site that later got another review and ported to a different platform. Both of us gave the game completely different reviews and scores, even though there were few to no differences in the versions we played. This continues to be how critique works. There's also the fact that the rubric for scores changes from site to site. Also, dare I say it, the fact that reviews are more complicated than just the number at the end. But then Fargo's baffled response reminded me of something, and I can't say if this is true of him, I'm not trying to, but it reminded me all the same. All of those factors that made me feel the way I feel are ones that seem not to occur to a lot of people. Everything about how many readers get mad at a review score without reading the review? I know I do. But the other thing Fargo's response reminded me of is that the word subjective has become something of a contested term, seen as bad or unprofessional to some readers. If you didn't watch my game reviews video, something I covered a lot there was that the viewpoint of subjectivity as being bad for reviews carries with it a fundamental misunderstanding of what game reviews are actually there to do. Without a critical subjective lens, the ability to say here is what I thought and why, you're not getting a review, you're getting a summary. The question I want to hone in on today is what role review scores play in that misunderstanding. More than anything, I want to talk about the truth that, yeah, game reviews are subjective, as subjective as the rest of the process. And that's a good thing. It's what's gotten us this far. To talk about why, we're going to have to talk about another <laughs> big Hollywood world-changing form of media and the critique upon it. Talk about movies. People might ask, well, how come I could give a thumbs up to Devil's Rejects, but right. not to this? Yeah. It's because I think any reasonable person looking at Devil's Rejects sees a film. Yeah. A film with a purpose, with performances, with a pattern behind it, with artistry in it. It's a horror film. Horror films are okay. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even violent horror films are okay. Wolf Creek is not in that category you can tell i mean there's just kind of i have a meter mm -hmm. and at one point during this movie i just said why am i here if there are true legendary names in the world of criticism the late roger ebert certainly ranks high among them on prowess alone ebert first gained notoriety as a film critic for the chicago sun times becoming the first ever film critic to win the pulitzer prize for criticism then, he and Chicago Tribune writer Gene Siskel became hosts of their own talk show reviewing film, popularized the thumbs up, yes really, and the rest is history. After Gene Siskel's death in 1999, Ebert continued to be a personality, working with Sun-Times colleague Richard Roper, and eventually winding down with a few final works leading up to his own passing in 2013. The mark left by Roger Ebert, even well before he died, 
was so great that you can go online right now and buy a book of all of his four-star reviews. Imagine that for video games. Imagine one day Adam Sessler is retired and puts out a Blu-ray of his most glowing reviews from X-Play. Maybe Sessler in particular would have the clout to pull that off, but even sitting here saying it, it sounds kind of far-fetched and pipe dreamy. But why, though? Roger Ebert is remembered not just for giving a lot of good or bad reviews, although certainly people love his more scathing ones, but damning and glowing alike, Ebert's critique was beloved by his fans in part because, after a while, you knew who was talking to you. TV helped with this, as did the fact that he was bouncing off against another critic. There are some infamous moments of disagreement between the two on At The Movies, and each one of those moments informed viewers of what made one person's viewpoint different from another. Die Hard has a lot of action scenes like the one on the roof, so many of them you're amazed the skyscraper doesn't turn into the towering inferno. They're dropping explosives down the elevator shaft and whole floors are being blown apart. But you can also see there, I think, one of the big weaknesses of the movie, and that's the idiotic behavior of the Los Angeles Police Department. There was one character in this movie, a deputy chief, whose actions are so stupid and so unmotivated and wrong-headed that finally he just brings the movie to a stop every time he opens his mouth. Bad writing. He always says the wrong thing. He understands nothing. And with a movie like this, once you start picking out the loopholes, and there are a lot of them, it doesn't matter how good the stunts or the special effects are, or even how good Bruce Willis is. You just can't stay interested. I did stay interested because I saw this as really a mano a mano between Bruce Willis, who I think is very good in the film, and Alan Rickman, who is really quite devilish and quite sinister and threatening. Well, what about all the cops on the ground? What about this deputy chief? But they stay even away from after, them. They stay away, after, they stay away from Willis him. Willis is brought down to the ground, yes. which is a miracle considering that all of the elevator shafts no. have been dynamited. I followed uh, him all the way through. Uh, the cop is standing there saying, we're going to bill you for all the damage you've caused. There I are mean, always... You groan at things There like are idiotic that. cops in the Dirty Harry movies, too, oh, when you no, laugh at them. I, the, I've watched far from all of Siskel and Ebert's episodes episodes, but I think they are actually at their best when they did disagree, because that disagreement shows more of what each critic thought of the movie. Talking about Die Hard here, you have Ebert claiming that stupid decisions from characters in the movie came down to bad writing, and then you have Siskel arguing that it's competent writing about people who screw up sometimes. Nobody's bringing out an objectivity chart to prove one of them right and one of them wrong. Well, no, I'm sure a lot of fans tried to do that, much like what we see with game scores now. But how does this iconic film critic relate to what we're talking about with video games? Well, the man scored his reviews with the best of them. Bring up Roger Ebert to anyone who reads, watches, ingests a lot of film critique, and chances are pretty good they'll be able to tell you a lot about the guy and his preferences, what he liked and didn't like, what really spoke to him in film, what he didn't have the time of day for. Why? Does that mean he was as guilty of injecting himself into his reviews as a lot of people get mad at game reviewers for being? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, it does. But he's not hated for it, and he's still celebrated for it after his passing. And that's because people who read his reviews were able to contextualize the critique with who was writing it. They didn't go, oh, the Chicago Sun-Times hated Joe Dirt. They knew Ebert did. They specifically knew Roger Ebert didn't like David Spade's weird poop fetish movie. If you read Ebert's reviews and heard him talk about what he loved in film, you'd come to understand what one star or two or three or the coveted four stars mean for him. This act of contextualization is something lacking between most game reviewers and their readers, I think. Any day, you can go on to website comments or Reddit threads or wherever else people are shouting with the rage of a volcano over nothing and find people saying, ah, oh, IGN, they give everything an 8 out of 10, or IGN needs to get it together and stop hating on this game I love. Hey, hey guys? Guys, who, who's IGN? Who is that? I don't, you keep talking about this person named IGN. I don't know that, is IGN coming over? Did you, did you invite IGN over? I, I don't even know this person. I gotta clean, I got so many fucking, I got so much shit to put away and fucking Garfield merchandise everywhere. Why do I need to hide my Garfield merchandise from IGN? It's a bad bit. At a big site like that with so many staff and freelance writers, it's hard, maybe even futile, to get a sense of a website's full identity across. 
I only know a couple of their staff members' opinions as well as I do because I've heard them talk on a million podcasts, followed them on Twitter, that sort of thing. Things that I sought out on my own. And big websites leave it up to you to seek out that information rather than having it face forward. These critics don't get the time to be known as individuals, not in the same way we talked about with Ebert. Video Game Donkey did a really good video that touches on this exact thing not too long ago. Suffice to say, he raises a good point about how hard it is to get an idea of what a game review means for you if you don't have some context for who's writing it. So let's flip this and talk about examples where we do get individual perspectives. I think a lot of individual YouTubers or writers on individual blogs get a better hand in this way. Video Game Donkey is one, actually. Most of his videos are pure comedy, but he's released enough founded in critique that you might start to get an idea of where his sensibilities lie. Donkey's an enjoyable guy, he's funny, he has a fantastic sense of timing in his gameplay and editing, and just generally knows how to make his content fun. So people like him. They like him so much that he's nearing 6 million subscribers. Hey, hey, you wanna throw some of those my way? Back around the start of the year, Donkey imposed upon himself the same dubious task assigned to many, reviewing Kingdom Hearts 3, a big game that mattered a whole lot to a whole bunch of very nostalgic people. In his review, Donkey was not exactly kind to Sora and his many friends. And sure, some people disagreed with his review, and some may have been mad at him for it, but over 5 million people have been following Donkey for a while now. They know him. Not a logo that he and a shifting sea of 30 other people write for. No, just, just him. Him. The, 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 the Donkey Man. They know him enough that they're able to see the next game he reviews through a him-centric lens. I remember when Donkey reviewed Xenoblade Chronicles 2, a game I had been excited for because it's the sequel to one of my favorite RPGs, I was surprised and annoyed by how long he harped on stuff like menus getting in the way of the game. But I was able to give it the context of everything else I'd watched by him that told me what he likes about video games. Donkey cares about gameplay that feels consistent with the right amount of gravity. He doesn't like having his time wasted or being bogged down by elements that seem non-essential to the central thread of a given game. He also speaks very cinematically about games. His God of War review starts out with him focusing in on why he finds the game's characters and artistic choices so compelling, before ever diving into the gameplay itself. So of course he isn't going to be as huge on a JRPG with a million menus and tutorials and 80 hours of stuff to do to distract you from the fact that you're playing some sort of horny fever dream. It doesn't really sound like his thing. But if it sounds like yours, you can watch his stuff and understand over time how your takes might differ from his. And even then, you might then go on to watch his recent one on Dragon Quest XI and have your understanding of him challenged and given more room to grow. Another example of this is quite common these days at Giant Bomb. Split across two offices on opposite coasts, the Giant Bomb folks gather yearly to record five really fucking long episodes of Game of the Year deliberations. I've been watching and listening to their content since 2015, and in that time, I've gotten more out of their critiques and disagreements than just about anyone else talking about games on the internet right now. I could go on, but all you really need to know is that in 2018, Red Dead Redemption 2 wound up in both their top 5 best games of the year and their top 3 most disappointing games. The former was headed from the endless praises sung the game by Brad Shoemaker, for whom it seemed to be an emotionally resonant experience. The latter was fueled by Dan Riker, for whom the game sullied a lot of what he had liked so much about the original. Both of them were as thorough and well-spoken as could possibly be expected. And both of them are allowed to be right. Ain't that swell. So any major site that enforces review scores is also going to enforce some kind of rubric that tells you what those numbers mean. Now, in theory, this is actually to help both writers and readers. For writers, it can be a helpful way to summarize. In all my time writing game reviews, if I learned anything about myself as a critic and a writer, it's that I myself sometimes struggle with this. I'm great at going on for a long time along a single strand of thought, extrapolating on an idea until there is nary an extrapolation left to extrapolate, but not nearly as good at tying my many fashionable and hand-molded tangents back towards a core point. Gee, it's a good thing my current writing style in no way reflects this. For readers, the existence of the rubric is, in theory, a sort of reading guide. 
I suppose you could argue for it helping out for readers who aren't familiar with the author of a given piece of critique. Sorry you don't have a whole lot of knowledge of Davy Davis and the Davis and his lovely review of Call of Duty 75, Mildly Interesting Warfare, but here's what his opinions on the game mean in relation to the website that dared to hire a man named Dave Davies and the Davis. The problem is, readers don't actually use score rubric this way. They don't really use it at all. Join me in a thought experiment for a sec. Think about an outlet whose content you read or watch with some regularity that uses review scores. Think about a specific review you read recently. Then think about what score it was given. Now think about what you know, offhand, without googling, about what that score means for the site in question. How'd you do? There are generalized understandings of what a 10 versus an 8 versus a 6 generally mean, but you don't exactly know. GameSpot could define a 7 as higher or lower than Polygon used to, and most folks wouldn't bat an eye. Those summary boxes some sites have at the end of their reviews help to do just that, summarize, but not always justify the scores. How do you justify a score in a summary when that's what the review should be for? <laughs> I don't want to just sit here and rag on IGN here, but Dunkey seems to, and I brought him up already. In one of his two Game Critics videos, he shows cases where IGN posts reviews littered with complaints about a game, summarizes those complaints at the end, sparing no expense, but then proceeds to give the game a disproportionately high score. Part of the problem, I think, is that while review score rubric exists, it's far from easy to make people notice it. Some sites kind of bury it, and that speaks for itself, but there are even ones like Polygon, which back when they did score their reviews, tried to put a link fairly prominently displayed to where you could read more about their scoring. But one of the biggest problems of review scores is that readers will click to a review, scroll down to the score, and react to it without ever reading the review. If it's that hard to get someone to actually read the critique the number is a reflection of, it's bound to be even harder to get that person to read a detailed explanation of what a 6.5 means to the good folks over at videogamewebsite.biz. But wait, there's regrettably more. The other problem with site-enforced rubric is assuming that writers are cool with it, or at times even thinking about it. I've seen firsthand cases where a writer at a site I was involved with would determine a review score based on what they interpreted the score to mean, rather than what the site determined. Now, to be crystal clear, I'm not saying that reviewers are hiding anything or have their own hidden agendas. They're not and they don't. Activision ain't paying them for high scores on fucking Battlefront whatever 5. Go to your homework and go to bed with that noise. Another place this manifests is the great underworld into which all game reviews must pass once they have fulfilled their work on this mortal coil. I am speaking, of course, of Metacritic. Knowing what we know about score metrics and expectations, it almost goes without saying why this system is severely flawed. It was bad enough when someone would go skip through a review to get to the score, and way worse when they can go to some other site that's helped them to skip all the reviews in favor of the scores. In case you couldn't guess, I'm not really a fan of Metacritic. I think the site falsely assumes that it can maintain the exact meaning of all the review scores it gathers well enough to give any meaning to the subsequent average it farts out. Just like seeing a review score won't tell you what parts of the game made a writer feel a certain way, the aggregation that Metacritic does only pulls us further away from actual discussion. If anything, it's kind of worth noting how much all of this sounds like the way we talked about the desire for objective game reviews as more a description than a review. I think Metacritic is kind of a perfect symbol of what that camp wants. And if you're willing to look closely, why what that camp wants is bad for criticism as a whole. Do you know how many opinions I had about video games when I was younger that were just freaking stupid. I don't because they're freaking countless. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I would defend flaws in games that were from series I liked just because they were from series I liked. I took the super edgelord stance of saying Ocarina of Time was bad just to be contrarian. And, you know, I was 14 when I was doing this stuff. I doubt a lot of people get their salt when they're that young. Then again, we live in an age when 10-year-olds are streaming fucking Fortnite and making millions of dollars. Back in my day, we would all gather around the one guy with the DS and Mario Kart, queue up, download, play, and we liked it. That was what it was like to be young. Point being, things change. 
individual critics' opinions can change over time. The critics at a bigger site can also change over time. And also, the state of a game can change over time in a way that reviewers have to adapt to. There's a relevant example of that I want to talk about from 2013 with Polygon and SimCity. <laughs> SimCity 2013 was part of a year of outrage over the always online game. The Xbox One was supposedly going to need a constant internet connection and people weren't happy about that, especially those living in places where reliable internet was hard to get. Amid all of this, Maxis and EA released SimCity, a city builder resource management type of game that required a constant connection to EA's servers through their origin platform. Russ Pitts reviewed the game for Polygon, and his initial review gave it a stunning 9.5 out of 10. Citing the game's ability to keep him addicted to playing, using systems that never felt like he was being tricked or having his time wasted. He made it clear in that initial review that he'd been given access to an advanced server for reviewers, which sounds fine, typical. And then, the masses were allowed through SimCity's gates and all hell broke loose. It seems that Origin had not exactly been ready to shoulder the load on launch day. And as a result, a lot of folks couldn't get into the game, and so Polygon did what at the time was a new idea to me, and updated the review, including its score. Then the problems persisted a couple days longer, and they dropped that thing down a well. Eventually, EA and Maxis were able to get things running well enough that the review score was bumped back up to at least middling, which I think was fitting. After all, the damage was done, and even if things got better, not being able to play the game for a month and a half after its release that probably shouldn't be forgiven or forgotten too easily. I bring this up as an example of revision done right. Pitts wrote the most accurate review he could before launch, then he and his managing editor Justin McElroy handled the issues that came post-launch as they went along. It does beg the question of whether they should have just held the review until the game came out, since you don't get a guaranteed accurate experience of an online-only game when just so many people are online, but that's maybe a conversation for another time. But one that we'll come back to, ooh, Jay's foreshadowing in his own video. So we have some building blocks here. We know that revision in reviews can be done well and justifiably under the right circumstances. We also know about site rubrics, so I want to throw out a couple hypotheticals. <sighs> Death Stranding! <laughs> Death Stranding, it's real, fuck. Death Stranding. It's real, it's here, and people have opinions on it. The game has received a real doozy of scores from all across the board. 9 out of 10 from GameSpot, 3 out of 5 from VG247, perfect 5 out of 5 Game Revolution, less perfect 2 out of 5 from Giant Bomb, 6.8 at IGN, 7 out of 10 at Game Informer, you get the idea here with Norman Reedus and the wildly divisive fetus. Something that I've heard talked about a good deal over at Giant Bomb, and I'm sure other places, is Death Stranding's online functionality. The way the game works, as you're traveling through its weird approximation of America what got ghosts in it, there's a lot of empty, kind of desolate space to traverse. But you can build things, adding markers and improvements to the world that will show up in other folks' games. I have not personally played Death Stranding but I have been interested enough in it to at least follow along, and heard about this for the first time on the Giant Beast cast the day the embargo lifted on the game. There was a pretty incredible hour-long discussion about the game there that I think can feed into the earlier point about context, but suffice to say, everyone was pretty harrowed with their time with the game. And then it's you can pop up, uh, this is Timefall Rain, it's gonna make your, uh, your shit go bad, and you yeah. have to use container repair spray on. It's like, okay, that sucks. It's like, oh, now my baby's crying, and now I gotta yeah. do that whole rocking thing. That yeah. sucks. Oh, put your blood in packs uh, so you can put them in the hemoglobin grenades and here's the bt thing yeah. like it just kept introducing thing after thing after oh, thing it, it does. and then as I, I there was no reward at the end so i would take the bullshit over the mountain and then talk to a hologram for a little bit and then he would introduce six new systems yeah. that weren't fun yeah. i am really trying not to be hyperbolic here and i think i mean this in all earnestness that i don't think i've ever hated a game put out by a major publisher more than this now keep in mind, they had played far from launch, when only other critics were on the servers. This was emphasized on the following week's Giant Bombcast, where Brad Shoemaker recounted seeing stuff left by specific writers from other sites, and how finding those things added to the game experience. Jan Ochoa talked about having played hours of the game completely offline, only to then take it online and see the world he'd been playing in suddenly be filled with things he hadn't seen before. 
To me, this sounds like the online element of the game is becoming gradually more influential on the game experience than it had been at first. Now that the game has been fully released to the masses, I'll be really curious over the coming weeks to see if and how opinion on the game might shift a bit, either for better or for worse. This all echoes the SimCity situation a bit. I have yet to hear of severe server issues since Death Stranding went live, but I've already heard people talk about influencing each other's games through what constructions were shared between them. Both situations come down to an online element changing the nature of the game post-launch. So does this mean that those who gave poor reviews to Death Stranding didn't have the complete experience? Should they go back and retract their reviews, rewrite everything, and then be sent into exile to live out the rest of their days with only the faded memory of their own sins against God and man? No, probably not. The negative reviews I've taken the time to read tend to focus more on other aspects of the game, like the main gameplay loop or the story beats. You see a lot of stuff that Sam doesn't see, right? They show you stuff, and you're putting it all together, and you've got and it. And it's not hard. You've got <laughs> it all. They fucking name the people Hardman. <laughs> you don't have to figure out. You don't have to be. Oh, a, he's called Die Hardman? You don't have I to don't be know a why. cardiologist to figure out why, right? <laughs> if a critic did feel so inclined, though, I think they should have every right to retract their review if the post-launch game changes things that much for them. Alright, so what else? What about when a game is reviewed by someone whose opinion is kind of in the minority on the site they're from? Rich George wrote a perfect 10 review of Skyward Sword for IGN. And that's always stood out for me because it came out back when I paid a lot more attention to their content and was a regular listener to their weekly Nintendo podcast. Even at the time, I remember getting the feeling that Rich George always felt a little bit more positive about the game than anyone else there, even the others who did really enjoy it. Fast forward a couple years and Rich George stops writing for IGN to go take a job at Nintendo of America. A couple more years pass and one day a couple other IGN writers on another podcast bring up that Skyward Sword review and everyone on that podcast kind of laughingly agrees that they don't really share the opinions of that review. This actually happened, I think it was maybe Brian Altano who brought it up in an episode of Beyond from let's say 2016. If you want me to spend hours looking for it, you can pay my ass. Now, neither you nor I knows that this is the case, but let's assume for a moment that no one currently at the site is really of the same mind that Rich George was. What if, one day, they decided to redact his review of that game? Let's set aside the question of where on earth they'd find the time to do that when it feels like every week a man from the internet rings my doorbell and hands me flyers for 20 new games coming out, along with a coupon for two pizzas and a two liter of grape fanta. What an oddly specific coupon, Mr. Internet, but who am I to say no? If IGN was to take down that review that none of them agreed with, how would they handle writing a new one? Just assign it to someone with a free schedule and a high tolerance for Link's beloved sidekick, Fantasy Clippy. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose? It's still just one person's review, not one representative of the site as a whole. Ha! You might be saying right now, Jay has written himself into a corner. I always knew this would happen one day. It was either going to be this or his crusade to force a Bionicle reference into every one of his videos. Well, I just proved you wrong on the second thing. Alright, the reason I drew such a long-winded thing there was to mosey us on back around to what passes through a thesis around here in J country. Giddy up. <laughs> At the end of the day, maybe more larger sites should take the lead of Polygon and Kotaku and ditch the score altogether. The Skyward Sword problem, an official site review that nobody at the site later agrees with, makes one wonder what that number really means then in that context. Does the review still have integrity? Are the numbers being interpreted more by the author than the audience? Why is this video so long and who let Jay talk in the first place? I think the answer is that when you're looking at a review score, you're not looking at the website's verdict, but just one person's. And a lot of sites go out of their way to obfuscate that fact. When that happens, the result is a review that readers can't accurately contextualize. They're being told to associate it with the site, which created the numbered metric and handed it to the critic to use, and not with the critic who actually wrote the thing. Who is the review score rubric for at the end of the day? I think it certainly can be for the reviewer in some cases. There have been times where boiling down my own thoughts to a number has helped me hone in on a point, 
but there have also been times where doing so has caused me to scramble and score a game in a way that, looking back, I don't really agree with at all. One of the reasons Roger Ebert succeeded is that people learned over time who he was by his own name and his own merit and personality. He wrote for newspapers and had multiple TV shows, yeah, but never were the names of those companies really put before his own when push came to shove. That's individual recognizability, and it's something a lot of game review outlets don't seem to get. Even if his name's not right up there, like in At The Movies, that show is always headed by him and Gene Siskel, so you figure it out. There are exceptions. Polygon's shift simultaneously away from numbered review scores and towards unique video content has filled a niche that I think was really needed. Things like Game of the Year videos done by individual editors with their faces right there, or videos of the whole office playing a game together. Giant Bomb's whole corner of the market is based on this. You hear and watch the same circle of 9 or 10 people over the course of all their content, and their names and personalities are always first. Sure, if you've been around for a while, you hear Giant Bomb and you probably think of Jeff Gersman and the rest of the old guard first, and newer folks like Abby Russell and Jan Ochoa second, but if you take just a bit of time, it's not hard to get an understanding of who these people are. That even includes people who have left the site and come back as guests. They get the same treatment because that's what that site's about. The whole site is people forward. It invites, not discourages you, to get to know those people. At the end of the day, I just want to see writers given more individual credit and attention for their work. I think a lot of writers at big sites, freelance and staff alike, tend to get rolled in with the, the collective thing they're writing for and not really given the space to be seen as the individual personality working there. The individual personality whose subjective view of things is gonna, you know, wind up in their review no matter what. So if we're fixating so much on review scores, this, you know, thing that is dictated by the collective entity, let, let the GameSpot hive mind to tell you their consensus on Far Cry 5. If we're really so fixated on that, maybe it's time to ditch the numbered score as a first step towards giving those individual personalities on those sites more chance to be seen. I've been Jay, I'm giving this video a 7.8 out of 10. Too much long!